Welcome everybody to another uh, AIM webinar. Uh, this is the sixth, I think, in, a, in our series of, of webinars. Um, to those of you who've joined us before on previous occasions, uh, again, I apologize that I'm going to uh, repeat myself a little bit, but uh, for anyone who's joining us for the first time, uh, an extra warm welcome. And I, I'd just like to take uh, just a minute to introduce uh, AIM, who we are, and a little bit of the, the work that we do. Um, so AIM is a, a non-profit non NGO uh, set up in 2010 by a, a group of Portuguese marine biologists. Uh, the, the association was really created to, uh, to try and provide a, a, a sort of a platform for conducting research into uh, the marine environment and marine life uh, around the Portuguese continental coastline. Um, we are, are based here in the, the south of Portugal, you can see in the map here, so uh, anyone who's not from Portugal, we're, we're just at the uh, southwestern tip of the Iberian Peninsula. We're very close to Albufeira, this is our sort of research area here um, in, in the south of Algarve, but AIM has also uh, conducted uh, some projects uh, elsewhere in Portugal and, uh, and elsewhere in the world. Uh, indeed, uh, our guest speaker today uh, has actually uh, is a, a former researcher with AIM and, and has participated in, um, in projects with us in, uh, in, in Portugal and also in Cape Verde uh, as well. Um, uh, so yeah, AIM is really there to collect uh, data and, 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 and research on primarily cetaceans, but also uh, fish and marine turtles and any uh, large marine vertebrates. Uh, but also we're engaged in uh, sort of education programs in the, within the local community uh, and we also run uh, an internship program during the summer months uh, where we receive uh, students and, and, and participants from all over the world who come to uh, study uh, the dolphins and whales that we, we have here uh, in the south of Portugal. Uh, so that's uh, a little introduction to AIM. Now I'd just like to give a very brief uh, introduction to what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, Guilherme will, will, uh, will give a proper introduction in a moment. But um, so yeah, today uh, we've, we're really uh, lucky to, to be joined with, by Guilherme Estrela. He is a, a, a researcher, a, a cetacean fanatic, bird nerd, I don't think he'll mind me, me saying that, um, but uh, Guilherme is uh, a, a, a researcher that's worked with us uh, for a few years in, in the past and has worked uh, in many places in the world, uh, in the Azores, in Norway, here in Portugal, Cape Verde, a uh, very knowledgeable guy and we're really lucky today uh, that he's going to uh, tell us a little bit more about the false killer whales of the Azores. So um, that's why you're all here. So I'm going to stop talking and uh, I shall stop sharing my screen. And, and Guilherme, if you're there, you can uh, start sharing your screen. Uh, let's see if this works. Perfect. Okay, so I'll hand over to Guilherme now uh, and uh, talk to you all uh, a little bit later. Right. Uh, can you can you can you see my screen? Is everything working properly? Perfectly. Very good. Right. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Guillermo, as Henry has already mentioned. Uh, I think uh, I could be called a, a cetacean fanatic and also a bird nerd. If uh, I also approve that one for, from you, um, I um, been interested in cetaceans for for most of my life. Um, I was very interested in every aspect, aspect about them. So I tried to uh, get in contact with cetaceans during um, my early days. And uh, I would like to thank uh, AIM for inviting me to this, uh, for this presentation since AIM has been an important part of my uh, career. Um, I, as Henry mentioned, I've been a part of the, I was a part of the team uh, for uh, um, a lot of uh, projects. And it really helped me develop some of the skills that I needed to, to take a step further into my career. Uh, and also uh, a lot of that is in this project. Um, so this uh, talk is uh, going to be about the false killer whales off the Azores. 
Uh, I will introduce false killer whales as a species before, and then I will talk a little bit about the research that we have been conducting. Uh, and all of this started in uh, 2011 when I first, uh, when I saw my first false killer whales, which I will get into uh, shortly. So to start off, uh, I'm going to just uh, talk about natural history of the species very briefly. The false killer whale was discovered in uh, 1846, which was uh, relatively recently by a um, zoologist, a British zoologist called Michael Owen, who after analyzing this uh, subfossil skeleton, placed it in the Focina genus, which is the porpoise uh, genus. Uh, in the same year, however, John Gray, a, a different zoologist, after analyzing this uh, subskeleton fossil and noting the similarities between the skull and the teeth of the, of the said skeleton with the, those of killer whales, actually placed the species in the orca genus. So it was uh, described as a uh, extinct relative of, of the killer whale for, uh, and it stayed like that for quite a while. It was uh, also in, on display at a museum. And then uh, 15 years later in 1861, uh, the first live specimen is documented, which was, of course, a, a huge change for this species. And uh, also in the same year, several other specimens became av available through strandings. And after uh, further analysis, it became evident that we were looking at, uh, they were looking at a living species that was neither a, a relative, extinct relative of the orca or the porpoises. And hence, in the following year, Reinhardt, uh, placed uh, the species in its uh, current genus, uh, which is Pseudorca. Um, and these are after the similarities between, as I said, the teeth and the skull uh, of true killer whales. Um, false killer whales, uh, despite their name, they're actually dolphins. So they are part of the dolphin family. Uh, and uh, they are not as closely related to killer whales as we once thought. And, and as John Gray thought back in 18, uh, 1846, um, recent genetic um, technology advancements have allowed us to uncover more of the lineage of the false killer whale as a species, and thus have allowed us to um, ascertain that it is actually more closely related to the resource dolphin, pilot whales, and both melon-headed and pygmy killer whales. And all of these are closer uh, relatives um, than the actual orca. Now, despite, um, of course, being called, um, being a dolphin and, and being called false killer whales given their size, uh, they are also uh, these five species. So the false killer whale, pilot whale, pygmy killer whale, and melon-headed whale, and the orcas are called blackfish. As this is a common name, not a, a, not a, a scientific uh, definition. And this is due to their uh, similar features in appearance, such as the dark skin color and also some other uh, behavioral features. So first, we're going to look at the uh, subject of study, the false killer whale itself. As I said, it is an oceanic dolphin, has a, a pretty wide distribution. It can be found in most of uh, our oceans, except for uh, Antarctica and some of the polar areas in the north as well. Although being a, a primarily oceanic species, they uh, also venture in coastal waters, um, and even though you can see all of these areas, they are considered infrequent throughout their range. So huge range, but not very frequently seen, which is uh, pretty interesting and you will see, understand a little bit more later on. Looking at the false killer whale, uh, they are primarily black, uh, torpedo shaped body. They have a uh, centered dorsal fin, which is normally small compared, is relatively small compared to other animals of this size, such as the pilot whale or even killer whales. They have a narrow and uh, gently tapered head, which tends to be conical in shape and no discernible beak on sight. The head is also very important for uh, sexing purposes, since there is a sexual dimorphism uh, feature between males and females in the rostrum, in which males will have a protruding rostrum, uh, which we also call an overbite, uh, whereas adult females will have a um, more melon-shaped head. Another feature of false killer whales, a physical feature, is their pectoral fins, compared to, of course, an orca or even pilot whales, 
and even the melon-headed and pygmy killer whales, they have really small pectoral fins, which have a unique shape uh, that is often called an elbow or a bump in the leading edge, which is uh, very useful to identify sometimes decomposed individuals that wash up on shore. This is always a uh, defining uh, feature. And uh, also something that is shared between other blackfish is the presence of a lighter area uh, in their belly. Um, in this case, the false killer whale will have a thoracic blaze, which is white or gray from their throat, all the way down to the genital area or even past that. It's something we see in pilot whales and uh, more or less in killer whales as well, uh, with them being completely white, of course. Some uh, general facts about ki false killer whales, they are, um, just like in other odontocetes, the male will be larger and heavier than the female, about six meters and 2.2 uh, .2 tons, whereas females are uh, a little smaller, uh, to, uh, to five meters and 1.3 tons. They have up to 46 teeth in their mouth, pretty large teeth. Uh, their scientific name, Sudorca crassidens, the crassidens is a reference to their fierce teeth. They have up to 46 with the 20-ish in each of the jaws, which they use to secure prey and also tear large chunks of prey. They feed mostly on fish, cephalopods, and also, although not as much, on cetaceans. As you can see, they, uh, tor their torpedo shape is um, an evidence for their speed. They will chase mostly pelagic fish such as tuna, marlin, uh, they will also feed on swordfish, mahi-mahi uh, or dolphin fish. So they are very active predators chasing large active fish, uh, but they will also feed on sometimes smaller fish and even sharks. Their diet is also made up of cephalopods. Uh, there are records of uh, deep water squid and also octopus being consumed by false killer whales as evidenced by uh, stomach contents and also the cetacean diet part, which is a, a bit of a controversy between biologists since there has not been yet a recorded uh, predation event of false killer whales on other cetaceans. Um, there have been, however, several cases of attacks, uh, such as a false killer whale pod harassing sperm whales. There's also a report of uh, false killer whales in Hawaii uh, killing a humpback calf but most of these are unfounded or uh, they don't have enough evidence to, to stand on their own. Uh, however, um, stable isotope analysis for certain populations has shown that uh, cetaceans, primarily smaller cetaceans such as dolphins, may be a part of their diet. Afterwards, go on to reproduction. False killer whales um, have some very interesting stats in their um, reproduction data. Calves are born at around two meters and weighing around 80 kilos, and uh, they will not mature. Uh, males will not mature uh, until sometimes they're 18 years old, whereas females will mature uh, sometimes between eight and 10 years old. Most of the data that we have about false killer whales is um, it comes from different areas. So, of course, we have to uh, judge every um, aspect with a bit of salt, uh, with a grain of salt, because mixing sometimes information about populations can be troublesome. So, in certain populations, males have not been uh, seen um, or documented sexually mature until they're, they're 17 or 18. But then in other populations, they can be mature, sexually mature at about six years of age. So, all of this uh, changes a lot with the population female data seems to be pretty consistent, so between eight and ten years. After a female uh, false killer whale mates, um, with which normally they mate with several males, uh, it, it has been suggested that they're not, mon not monogamous, of course. The gestation period, so pregnancy lasts between 14 and 16 months, which is um, a long period of time. Um, and after the calf is born, uh, normally the female will care for the calf for at least two years. It will nurse, uh, nurse the calf for a year, uh, but the calf may stay with its mother for about four years or even longer. Um, and during this period, sporadic uh, nursing is, occasional uh, nursing is also, has also been observed. Um, so do this, um, this system in which the female cares for the calf for this long um, suggests a high uh, parental investment in calves 
and makes us makes it so that they actually have only about one calf every 6.9 years, so every seven years, which is a very slow calving rate. And considering that uh, individuals then need to live up to at least seven or eight years of age to reproduce, means that the false killer whale uh, has a, a very uh, slow recovery time if any threats are to occur in a certain population. It has also been shown that um, uh, males and females seem to have a similar lifespan, which is very curious when considering other uh, blackfish species, such as the killer whale uh, or the pilot whale, in which the female has almost doubled the lifespan of the male. And uh, in killer whales, this has been shown to probably be connected to their post-reproductive lifespan, in which females will go through menopause, but remain an important a core part of the, of the pod by um, helping other females raise their calves and also direct the group and probably teach the pod uh, foraging techniques and so on. So false killer whales, they do not have this, um, this part, uh, particular uh, feature. Males and females seem to live about the same age. Again, there's not a lot of data on false killer whales and this is not very difficult to, this is not um, something that it's very difficult to estimate. So in uh, long term, we might discover that it's actually uh, different or maybe they females do live a lot longer, but for now this is what we have. And um, based on stranding data and also hormone analysis, it has been uh, suggested that false killer whales may have also a post-reproductive life uh, of about 20 years, given that most of the females above 44 years old uh, showed uh, little to no evidence of being able to produce calves. So this is very interesting and um, also coupled with the evidence that females, even though they cannot, they probably do not reproduce uh, as much or at all after a certain age, they are still able to lactate up until the, the 60, 60 years old. So there might be some grandmothering strategies like in killer whales where females will help uh, other pod members with their calves. Now, going on to their social structure, this is uh, one of the most interesting parts for me. Uh, false killer whales, um, they have what we call a clustered social structure in which individuals within a cluster have um, bonds. Some individuals will be more strongly linked to others. But um, of course, we're talking about sometimes uh, groups of 60 or 80 animals or 50 animals, we're talking a, a decent number. In this case, the PowerPoint has just a few to, to show you the idea, but a cluster is, consists of a, a group of, uh, of individuals which is connected, they are interconnected, and um, false killer whales will split into subgroups to forage, as you will see later. So usually within a cluster, we have uh, several pods uh, that are temporary, meaning that these are just uh, temporary pods, they will split up uh, forage, they will forage in a certain area, then they will meet back together. And during these meetings, uh, sometimes um, fusion and fission of certain pods occurs, meaning that some pods break up and uh, those individuals will join another pod, or even in some situations, the entire, um, the two pods may get together and form a larger pod or, or several pods might form a super pod. With also in a few situations, having, um, there are also some records of the entire clusters being together in the same area. So they have this fluid social structure, but still uh, connected to each other and maintaining um, specific uh, relationships with each other. When it comes to behavior, um, false killer, perhaps one of the most um, defining uh, characteristics of false killer whales are their movements. They are uh, best described as nomads, moving great distances and sometimes in a short amount of time in search for food. Uh, they are uh, very active swimmers, often porpoising and swimming pretty fast. The maximum um, recorded speed is probably around 20 kilometers per hour, but uh, there have been in instances where I've been present at sea and going parallel with them at more than 20 kilometers per hour. So they're probably capable of, of shorter, uh, faster bursts, but um, they are overall very um, active species in terms, in terms of movements. 
one specific individual, which was tagged in Hawaii, uh, moved for over 450 kilometers in just four days, um, averaging about 120, uh, 112 kilometers per day. And I say at least because the uh, data uh, from the tag does not allow us to infer uh, if between certain points there were off movements. So uh, usually the data um, from satellite tags will connect certain points on a time frame. And in this case, it was at least 449 kilometers in four days, which is uh, impressive. A pod also observed in a different area um, for about 16 hours was averaging 15 kilometers per hour at the end of the track, which is also a very um, active day for them. Here I have a, um, a very interesting slide, and this uh, is a track from a, a male false killer whale that was tagged in the, um, off the big island of Hawaii, which is this one here to the bottom right. It was uh, uh, attached to the dorsal fin with a crossbow, and these are uh, the latest technology in tags. They're very small, recording temperature, depth, uh, location, and other, also other interesting uh, metrics. And I will play this for you just so you can see how much they move. So between each movement, we will have 12 hours. So the tag will uh, show every time the line moves, it will be 12 hours of movements. So just for you to get an idea, we start off with the animal, with the individual, uh, just moving around the north shore of the big island, just circling this area. Then a few trips to offshore waters off the shelf before deciding to just completely leave Big Island and start moving towards the Northwest, in which it passes through the islands, goes around the island of Niihau, and then goes back and then back again. And this is um, a testament to the type of movements that they incur in. They move long distances, sometimes pretty fast, um, which makes it extremely difficult, makes them extremely difficult to follow and to study. Imagine if you are working just off this island for this entire period of time, you would never see this individual, which would make it very difficult to gather any info about it. Let's see. Uh, now on to foraging. False killer whales are very social in almost everything they do, and foraging is not an exception. They are very, very uh, tight when foraging, uh, actually when feeding, but while searching for prey, they normally will spread out over an area, uh, and this is what we call a line abreast formation, and it is uh, believed to increase their foraging success. If individuals are spread over a, a large area, they will uh, mo more easily detect prey, which then is um, alerted to other individuals through acoustics, through whistles, and then they will congregate in the area where the prey was spotted and try to catch it uh, and feed on it together. So here in this image, you can actually see a picture taken in the Azores of four individuals. One of them is hitting here behind. Uh, four individuals that uh, caught a tuna, which at this stage was unrecognizable. It was completely ripped to pieces and uh, one individual was carrying it at the surface while other, the others at the side were biting slow, uh, slowly biting pieces of it and thus sharing the food, which is then passed down to other members. This uh, behavior in which the prey is brought to the surface is sometimes called prey flashing, which is a, a, a behavior which facilitates uh, collection of data regarding diet, because if you see the prey being, being brought at the surface, you will most likely know what it is. And in terms of the, uh, when it comes to false killer whales, they often predate, predate on these larger uh, uh, species. So it, is, it becomes fairly easy to tell at least what type of fish it is, if it is a tuna or a wahoo or any other type. As I said, they spread out over a certain area. As you can see here, this is just an example of an individual with several individuals in a 10 kilometer radius. Um, this is uh, observed also at sea, and when you find, for example, this individual or the individual in the middle, it becomes very difficult to know how many individuals are around, what's the group size, and uh, sometimes um, all you get is uh, one single individual photographed when there could be others around. 
Um, in also a few situations, this is a more, more of a curious behavior. Uh, passing of fish has also been observed uh, for humans. So divers are in the water with false killer whales. It has happened at least twice in Hawaii where um, the false killer whale actually brought a piece of the fish and left it in front of the diver and uh, after that picked it up back again. So a very interesting social behavior. Also um, a note on being social towards other species, which is very interesting behavior overall. False killer whales are very acrobatic, uh, a very acrobatic species. Uh, a friend of mine who works in Costa Rica and sees them very often says that false killer whales are the largest thing out there that behaves like a dolphin. They are very active, often, often leaping out of the water. They will uh, do backflips, uh, chin slaps, uh, sometimes just uh, completely falling on their side. As you see this calf here that literally jumped, uh, breached almost on top of another adult on the side. And um, this is very typical during socializing and also during feeding before during and after they get a kill, they will often leap out of the water and sometimes even carry the prey in their mouth. Uh, so just grasp them, grasp them between their teeth and uh, it's a very common thing for them to do. Whether they do it for um, signaling purposes or just uh, other empirical um, reasons, we don't really know yet, of course. Now on to diving. Um, Previously, since false killer whales were observed mostly feeding on pelagic fish, it was believed that they were spending most of their time at the surface and um, feeding mostly on the animals that live uh, close to the surface. But uh, false killer whales are also one of the most likely species to strand with the largest mass stranding reaching about 800 individuals. And those strandings, although unfortunate, have allowed us to take a look in their stomach contents and most of them were, uh, had squid beaks or cephalopod beaks in their stomach. So it, scientists began to theorize that they were able to dive, but it wasn't until relatively recently that a tagged false killer whale showed us this by diving to 927 meters in Hawaii and staying submerged for about 15 minutes, which is uh, amazing. Uh, based off of other diving uh, dive data, diving profile data, um, researchers in Hawaii, is, um, they estimated the maximum dive, dive depth, depth to be uh, about 1,500 meters, even though it has not been uh, recorded yet. Another uh, common behavior for false killer whales, and perhaps this is also their downfall, is their tendency to engage in depredation. Now, depredation is when an animal is uh, taking um, or trying to take uh, fish from fishing gear, so from uh, our fisheries. And uh, the false killer whale, along with killer whales and other blackfish, are one of the uh, species that are most problematic in this sense, as they often interact with fisheries to take bait or catches. Um, in most scenarios, their preferred uh, fishing gear or the easiest to access is long lines, uh, are the long lines, which you can see represented here, a very long line that is floating um, near the surface and has a hook with bait every uh, few meters. And this uh, is very easy, uh, makes it very easy for false killer whales to, to take the catches as they will swim long distances um, every day. And so they can just swim along the long line and. And research has shown that not only do they sometimes ruin entire catches by either taking all of the prey or damaging the remaining prey, but they also seem to feed specifically on um, some species such as swordfish and tuna, and they will leave other species on the line sometimes. So they show a preference towards certain types of uh, prey and also to certain parts of prey, whereas some species had parts missing in them Others, other, uh, others would have, for example, only the head attached to the hook. Others would have only um, sometimes the entire body, but not the belly. So they have preference for prey and also for uh, parts of prey. Uh, depredation has been assigned as the main cause of decline for a lot of the Hawaiian uh, false killer whales. And uh, it is also a problem for economic reasons, as you might imagine. And in, this, uh, in these events, 
they frequently get uh, tangled, hooked, and injured or even killed. Uh, so given this uh, tendency to interact with fisheries and also the long calving period, um, they are a very um, susceptible species to, to this threat. Now, if you, um, if you have been paying attention, of course, you have noticed that I keep speaking about Hawaii. And the reason why uh, this, this happens is because unfortunately, and fortunately at the same time, the Hawaiian uh, population of false killer whales is the most well studied in the world meaning that they have a lot of uh, data, they have genetic samples, they have tagging going on over there. And so most of, the, of what we know about the species comes from this specific project that has been running for about 30 years now. Um, however, uh, it is interesting to note that most populations around the globe, um, not counting the ones in Hawaii, they seem to follow at least to some extent most of the things that I just told you, they are very active, moving a lot during the day. Um, they will feed on the same prey, so pelagics, uh, or also cephalopods. Um, they are very acrobatic. So all of these, they seem to be um, basal features for the species. And uh, when um, I first thought about beginning this project, one of my questions was, are they similar? Uh, in what way are they similar? amongst other questions. So now we're going to uh, leave Hawaii and uh, hop onto the Azores and talk a little bit about the work that we have done there. Um, first, I will start by introducing the area of, of, of study, which is the Azorean archipelago. And um, you can see that it has a northwest to southeast orientation. Uh, it's made up of nine inhabited islands um, divided in three groups. In red here you have the western group, the central group in the middle in green, and the, uh, in yellow the eastern group which has the largest and capital island of San Miguel. Now the archipelago is located uh, almost in the middle of the Atlantic about 1300 kilometers from Lisbon and over 2000 kilometers from the US and um, these all of these islands are volcanic meaning that um, there is a uh, and all of them a very steep slope off the coast of the islands, which makes it uh, easier to access deeper water uh, after just a few kilometers of leaving land. Um, they're also about 60, 615 kilometers across. And um, here you can, cannot see it, of course, but in this map, but there are also very, a lot of uh, geological aspects to this uh, underwater area that is invisible right now that are uh, good for uh, productivity, such as banks, sea banks, sea mounts, uh, plateaus, uh, some deeper areas as well, slopes, and uh, those make it an ideal uh, habitat for, uh, in this case, more than 25 species of whales and dolphins, one of which is the false killer whale. So everything started here in these islands in 2011. I was living and working in Fayal Island as a volunteer um, and I got to see my first false killer whales. They were here just off the coast of Pico, traveling really close to the coast, I would say maybe less than 50 meters from the rocks. Um, and they were associated with bottlenose dolphins, which was a very interesting thing for me at the time, because apart from knowing their name and, their, and knowing how they looked like, I knew next to nothing about them. So this fateful encounter in, in uh, July of, 2000, of 2011 uh, really got me intrigued about the species. So as soon as I got home, I tried to look for uh, any information that I could get regarding this species. Um, but unfortunately, uh, at the time, uh, also, I would will reckon that my uh, Googling skills maybe were not as good. But at the time, uh, there were a few uh, relevant articles about false killer whales um, especially in the Azores. There were a few, a few about Hawaii and a few about other populations such as New Zealand, but um, nothing very, uh, nothing solid. So I was even more intrigued at this time. Um, as you can see here, one of the articles that I checked is the note on the presence of this species in the Azores. So the first note on their presence, which was in 89. It's a, a very recent uh, note of presence. Um, and 
of course, I just got fired up to know more about them, where they go, et cetera. And these are some of the questions that popped into my head. What are, what's the population size and structure? How are they socially organized? Uh, what do they eat? Where do they eat or feed? Um, what's their site fidelity? Are they resident, semi-resident? Are they just random passing by? Are they seasonal visitor? Um, of course, we didn't know anything. And most importantly, what's their conservation status in the Azores? To um, learn more about them, I also started looking into research methods and I uh, deemed that the easiest and at the time the only way to do so was by using photo ID. The photo ID is a process through which we photograph and identify individual individuals based on uh, body markings and they have to be more or less uh, long lasting because otherwise we cannot follow an animal through time. Uh, I did not have a camera back then so I launched a uh, fundraiser online and got myself almost a thousand euros to buy a camera, which was quite surprising. And then I started gathering pictures. And here you can see uh, highlighted in red, a male false killer whale, which is um, very common around the island. So this is one of the most common individuals that we, we have seen. He was first seen in 2007 uh, seven as a, a juvenile or sub-adult with almost no nicks, but a couple of nicks down here at the trailing edge allowed us to follow this individual into uh, 2018 actually there are some data that we still haven't processed but we know that he's been seen and we also um, confirmed that he is a male given the of course the rostrum um, overbite now um, dorsal fins are not the only thing that we can use in false killer whales definitely the most reliable and the one we look at but uh, I would like to show you a case of um, another body marking allowing us to make a very interesting match. So here uh, on the left we have two false killer whales that were observed in uh, one of the islands and uh, this is not a, a very good picture quality wise. Uh, there's a lot of um, these uh, false killer whales are backlit and it's not very easy to look at the fin but if you look here at this area you will see that there is a scar in the peduncle of this animal which um, is quite fresh and the uh, it, although it might disappear and probably has already disappeared with time, uh, false killer whales don't tend to uh, have many scars or at least they will uh, turn black uh, later on and disappear or be almost invisible. But in this case, this individual which was seen on the 7th of July was then photographed underwater 19 days later on a different island. Uh, and the only way we know this is because of this scar, which as you can see is exactly the same. And not only were we able to match these two individuals, this, uh, these two individuals, but also the individual in the background is the same as the one in the foreground in this picture. So we have, uh, uh, based on this sighting, and they were also seen in between these two dates, we have some information about their movements from Tercera Island to Fayal Island in 19 days. Of course, we don't know which route they took, but it's a uh, really inf uh, interesting information that we got off a single scar. So very interesting. After working um, for about two seasons in the Azores, I started uh, feeling like it would be almost impossible to get anywhere. Uh, as you might imagine, uh, being a very active species means that they are very infrequently sighting, sighted in the Azores. They could also be um, just animals that are occasionally there. So after just two years and six sightings, um, I was feeling uh, really demotivated because I just felt like I could not uh, get anywhere on my own. I didn't have enough, um, enough trips. I didn't have enough time. I wasn't on the sea enough, uh, or sometimes I wasn't on the sea at all when they were being seen. So my data collection was uh, pretty poor. And in two years, I got only about 100 pictures, which is not a lot. Um, so I started thinking about um, other projects and how they solve their problems. And again, turning to Hawaii, as you might notice, the Hawaii is, was a big inspiration for this project. Uh, they actually set up a network where uh, tour operators would send pictures over to the researchers so they could then uh, match those pictures and get uh, not only more data, but data from different places. 
So um, I contacted several um, operators and several researchers in different islands, and I managed to create a partnership with four different entities. Um, in Fayal Island, I partnered up with Norberto Diver, which is a whale watching company, and Pico of Riberas, Nova Atlantis Foundation run by Karen Hartman, studies the resource dolphins, but also any other cetacean off the coast. And uh, I also um, partnered up and worked for Ocean Emotion Whale Watching, which is, which is a company based on Tercera Island. Um, but it was the most important thing for me was getting data from the Eastern and Western groups, because it is more, most, more likely that animals seen in Fayal will show up at Pico or in Tercera, given the proximity. What we really wanted to, to know was also if the movements also uh, made them travel to other groups. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to uh, get any uh, connections with the Western group, which has, I'm still working today. Um, but I did get, we did get a connection with the Eastern group, um, with Futurismo Azores Whale Watching, which is a whale watching company as well. After this, the data started flowing in, uh, just from uh, Lisa, uh, which works at Norberto Diver, Lisa Steiner. She's a researcher, mostly focused on sperm whales. I got over 7,000 pictures just from her, and also a few hundred from other places. And then um, at that time is when the project really kicked off. So uh, some of the results that we obtained from this, um, from this, uh, from these cooperations with other entities uh, were um, insane. We had over 20, uh, 120 sightings from 1999 to 2018. Uh, we had sightings from January to December. We had uh, over 8,000 pictures right now. I just received a couple thousand more two days ago. So uh, it, the number keeps growing, of course. Uh, we have cataloged over 100 individuals. We have verified a lot of uh, long-term associations between certain individuals such as these two males, which I just showed in the previous example with the scar, they have been seen multiple times since 2012 together, and a lot of times just the two together. So it might be a case of uh, uh, long-term associations between males, uh, as uh, we also see in bottlenose dolphins. And of course, one of the main goals of the um, association with other, company, with other companies and operators was the inter-island, and also inter-island group matches, which we got a bunch as well. During the, these, uh, all of these, um, during all of this time, I still kept going out uh, and gathering data uh, whenever I could see them, uh, and the others did the same. So we learned also a few um, other facts, such as new prey species, uh, like the mullet, um, which is uh, present in the harbors, but also around the coast and uh, also uh, wreckfish and other species. Here you can see uh, just a little bit of the catalog with the left and right side catalog for four individuals. The picture in the middle here shows a group of females and a juvenile feeding on a bluejack mackerel, which is also a new species recorded, a uh, new prey species recorded for false killer whales. Taking a look at the matches, we have, um, here in the blue table, we have the inter-island matches where uh, we are documented with which individuals were seen uh, or if any individuals were seen on different islands, uh, which of course they were. Here, uh, for example, the first example, we have an individual which was seen in Fayal, which is the name central group, and San Miguel in the eastern group and then back in the central group. So we have a back and forth movement between the two. And uh, also other uh, individuals which uh, had similar movements. In terms of long-term matches, we have several individuals which seem to be regulars in the Azores, meaning that we uh, see them, uh, we have been seeing them regularly over the course of a few years. Um, for example, A17 has been seen in 2005, 2014, 15, 16, 18, and also uh, has been seen um, last year. So 14 years, uh, a total of uh, 14 years, a period of 14 years, during which this animal visited the Azores at least a few times. We have several individuals in this case and uh, also other individuals with smaller uh, spans. And this can also be due to uh, just uh, bias in the effort. So we might not be always seeing the same individuals. 
uh, or sometimes even the dorsal fins not having nicks at the time are becoming unrecognizable. So the photo ID analysis shows several long-term matches, um, inter-island matches, inter-group, inter-island group matches, and um, the fact that they are so uh, hard to come by, um, combined with the amount of recitings, uh, seems, uh, may indicate that some part of the population might show some site fidelity to the area, or it could mean that there is a, uh, the population size is pretty small, which explains why we see the same individuals over and over. During our research, a lot of calves were also documented. Neonates were documented on several occasions, which could indicate uh, the Azores as a, a potential breeding ground for, for false killer whales. Um, they uh, are also, uh, have also been seen in association with several other species, such as the bottlenose dolphin, which is by far the most common companion of false killer whales. A lot of our sightings, I believe uh, around 30% of our sightings, uh, they were uh, associated with bottlenose dolphins, but there have also been other associations with smaller dolphins, such as uh, spotted dolphins, common dolphins, and striped dolphins, which probably indicates that they do not have a, a predator-prey relationship. Uh, all of the, uh, these interactions seemed peaceful, and they were swimming in close proximity, uh, not displaying any aggression. And also some interactions with the larger species, as you can see here with the false killer whale trailing a juvenile fin whale, um, but in this, in this specific interaction and in other interactions with not only fin but say whales, uh, we have never observed any aggressive behaviors that would suggest um, any type of predator prey relationship. Um, <clears throat> however, when we look at this, at this data, uh, although we are very uh, surprised and, and uh, also motivated to continue, it's also important to look at all of the data with, um, in a different angle. To put it bluntly, the data that we have is very biased in, very, uh, in many ways. Just to start, uh, only four out of the nine islands have whale watching. The ones represented here in orange are the ones operating whale watching tours, which means that uh, a lot of areas in the archipelago aren't covered by these uh, whale watching companies. Uh, something which is uh, also a problem, or in this case, a uh, more of an obstacle, is how seasonal whale watching is. From November to uh, more or less February, the weather is uh, pretty unforgivable, pretty unforgiving, so it's difficult to organize whale watching, and we don't have a lot of data from this period. Whale watching companies themselves, of course, they are businesses, meaning that uh, the limiting, li the surveying range uh, is very limited. I uh, painted here in yellow, so you can see in Fayal Island, uh, tours often go around Fayal. In Pico, tours often go around Pico and even Fayal. But for Tercera, because the harbor is located in the south area, we do not cover the north. So all of this area is unaccounted for. And even these areas here, uh, further away from the island, are just not uh, covered frequently. Same in São Miguel, with only a southern area and a, a part of the north during a certain period of the year. Another uh, problem with uh, our data is that most of the whale watching boats have a sighting preference. People want to see whales, so they um, uh, whale watching boats will communicate with each other and they will move on to uh, sightings of blue whales, fin whales, sperm whales and larger animals, uh, which will, of course, concentrate a lot of the effort around the same animal, leaving the entire area around it unexplored and unaccounted for. So if false killer whales are moving through this area, which they certainly do, we might not know about it. And actually, most of our sightings are accidental, meaning that we are moving from one point to another and we just find them. In the Azores, there's also a uh, technique in place that helps whale watching, um, which is the land-based spotter. Each company has a spotter, which is located on land, usually on a higher spot, on a um, vantage point. And this person with very big binoculars and powerful tries to search for blows to then uh, use the radio and tell uh, boats where to go. So it's a kind of a directed whale watching, but this, uh, um, this uh, I would say technique 
is also flawed uh, when, when you're actually trying to find uh, different species because spotters will most likely see blows. Blows are larger animals. They're not as uh, good as spotting dolphins. Um, and this is what I call spot, spotter tunneling. So if they are seeing a whale, a large whale, they will stay locked onto it and they will not search for or survey, survey areas around it. Um, and especially, this is especially a problem if the false killer whales are moving along the coast or near the coast because spotters are most, um, uh, most often looking into the horizon where uh, the whales are most likely to be. So um, even though we have a lot of interesting data, um, we have to think uh, also about how much we don't know, how much our data is affected by these factors, um, and also think about um, how to improve this, um, this situation. Most of the times, as you might imagine, whale watching boats don't uh, track their, their, um, their trips. So we don't have uh, track, tracking records for sightings or even for unsuccessful surveys. But um, of course, we are only working with area uh, designation, so geologic, uh, geographical position and pictures. Um, so this is about it. Uh, the data, we, st I still have, we still have a lot of data to analyze. Uh, as a matter of fact, about two hours ago, I got a call uh, from a couple of friends as they just found false killer whales in Terceira Island. Um, and of course, another sighting that we have to account for. And this is an ongoing process. We expect a lot of the things we know now to either change or just be completely scrapped. Uh, because of course, most of what we um, we are seeing is assumptions based on the data. Um, and I hope you uh, got a better idea about the project, how the project is working, um, about the methods that we use to accomplish, um, and overall a better idea of some of the challenges of a project like this. So um, thank you very much for, for attending. I hope you uh, enjoyed the presentation and I hope you have uh, some questions or if you have any type of question, just feel free to, to ask. And um, I, I'm going to uh, pass the word over to, <laughs> to our colleagues here. Yeah. Well, uh, Guillermo, uh, that was fantastic. And uh, let me uh, just on behalf of, of um, uh, all of our participants uh, watching and, and all of my colleagues here uh, at AIM, just uh, say thank you very much for that. It was really thank you. informative. Thank you. Um, I can I could see it was a really nice presentation. Um, so uh, yeah, really well done. I, I'm sure that people must have uh, some some questions. Um, if anyone would like to uh, to get us going, you can uh, just uh, uh, drop a message in the chat window there. Um, I, I think. Uh, I think what was really sort of amazing about about this is just certainly talking from my own perspective. This is a species that, uh, much like Guillaume was saying when he that first time he he saw them, I I kind of know a little bit about what they look like and and the name, and that was about it. So it was uh, really nice to to get some more in depth information about this species. Um, do we have any questions? I think. Um, well, we have some comments. Someone else uh, thanking you, Guillermo. Um, uh, okay, so this is a good question from Teresa. Uh, Teresa, would you would you like to unmute your microphone? Maybe you can talk directly with Guillermo. Um, if if you prefer not to, that's fine. I can uh, pass on the question to him. Uh, I'll just give you a, a moment. Uh, ah, okay. No, okay. she's in a busy area. So, but uh, Guillermo, can you also read these? Yes, of course. You can. Okay, so go go ahead. So the what uh, Teresa asks, what's the main observation you would like to find out from your research? Um, personally, um, I, I I am very passionate about uh, cetaceans, and uh, I reckon some of my colleagues here probably know that's uh, sometimes too passionate, and uh, especially in my early years. Uh, when I first uh, started, when we first started looking into this data, I was hoping they were residents. Of course, we lived there. Um, I live. I lived in the Azores for a while. Um, it's uh, a little bit um, uh, difficult to 
uh, not expect something. Uh, we see them, uh, they are uh, certainly a impressive species to observe, but I think in the beginning, I was, my main goal was to try to prove that they were resident. But of course, uh, as I uh, grew and also gained more experience, uh, naturally it came, it occurred to me that when you're trying to um, make science, if you can say that, um, you should of course have a goal in mind, but you should have a open mind about the data. So I would say that at, it, at first I was trying to connect everything with the residency question, but uh, now I am more uh, focused and open um, about other aspects. So my main uh, observation, the thing that I would like most, most to find out is um, uh, probably their conservation status. Because being a um, species that engages in depredation very often, uh, we might even have a problem that we're not aware of. Uh, a paper that was published um, about fisheries interactions with cetaceans in the west of the Azores, uh, which was uh, <coughs> conducted on board of a fishing vessel, um, they actually uh, calculated the rates of um, false killer whale bycatch and interactions to be similar to the, those of Hawaii. And in Hawaii, the government and researchers are working closely to try to implement measures to um, reduce bycatch and reduce risks associated with the interactions, such as removing barbs from fishing hooks. But so far, they have not been able to produce a uh, significant result and a big percentage of the population has uh, fishery interaction related injuries in their bodies. So perhaps the most important for me would, would be to gather enough information to uh, be able to know how many there are, uh, if they are resident or not, but in uh, the light of conservation. That would be my answer right now. Well, Teresa, I hope that uh, that very honest and, and thorough answer um, satisfied you. That's, I think, a really good point that Guillermo makes there, um, uh, just to keep that open mind about the data that's coming in. Um, so, Guillermo, we also have a question from Luana, uh, yes. Luana Clementino. Out of curiosity, why the Azores and what are the main difficulties you're finding in your research? Um, so uh, the Azores, um, as a Portuguese, I would say, as a Portuguese uh, cetacean fanatic, it's difficult not to know about the Azores. When I was really young, uh, 15 years of age, I was dreaming of, of visiting. Um, I was, um, of course, wanted to, to know the area. Uh, and so it started out like that. We, I knew it was a beautiful place, a lot of cetaceans a uh, place where I could learn more about species, where I could um, also um, get, get some experience at sea. And uh, so it started out as a, the ideal place to be, if you like whales, basically. Um, but of course, um, having engaged in a marine biology degree, but never finished, uh, I have, uh, I say me and also my colleagues, we have uh, some uh, limitations as to what we can do on a scientific basis. Uh, one of which would be, of course, to, to get grants. If we had, if I had the opportunity to get a grant, I could buy a small boat or rent a small boat and uh, conduct specific um, um, research surveys. Or we could be stationed on land and then have whale watching companies let us know if there are false killer whales for us to go out since they are so infrequent. We're risking going out uh, for a month and not seeing them, of course. So I think the, the lack of a uh, pure um, scientific boosts in, in, in the form of a grant or something uh, more, um, how to say it, something more uh, official with the university has definitely set me back and us back and uh, left us relying on whale watching for data. And whale watching, you know, we often spend a lot of time with the not target species um, and we don't stay very long, a maximum of 20, 30 minutes with them. So we cannot get tracking data. Sometimes we cannot uh, obtain the, uh, all of the fins in the pod for a photo ID. So uh, whale watching is a, 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 an opportunity, platform of opp opportunity, but also very limited in its own. And I think that's um, the main difficulty that we have. Yeah, okay. Um... So yeah, also just some really nice <coughs> comments uh, here from Andrea. She really enjoyed 
uh, your presentation, yeah. Guillaume. And, and then Teresa just has a follow-up question, uh, yes. if you can see there, about the longline fishery. So is a pelagic longline fishery is very common in Portugal, and would you say that it's their biggest threat? Um, I will address the latter part of the question. Uh, we do not have enough data to uh, know that for sure. We don't even know uh, whether or not the populations uh, are uh, faithful to the, the Azores, if they are just coming to the Azores at a specific time. Uh, we do not have enough data to infer this. Um, Longline fishery in Portugal is uh, common. Uh, in the Azores, it is particularly common as it is not a, you're not allowed to trawl in the Azores. So most of the fisheries are longline fisheries. But there's also a big, uh, big problem with the other fishing vessels fishing outside the ZEE, the, the EEZ, the Economical Exclusive, Exclusive Zone, uh, which might pose a, a problem if they don't follow the regulations, it might pose a problem. Um, and that's the reason why, one of the reasons why uh, Portugal was um, trying to expand its ZEE uh, in order to uh, also gain control of these areas. But it is uh, relatively common. Uh, in this case, the paper that I mentioned earlier was a Spanish vessel, which was fishing outside of the 200, 200 nautical mile limit of the Portuguese ZEE. But of course, 200 nautical miles could still be potential uh, habitat for these animals. So um, it is uh, a threat, definitely a threat. We just don't know how big of a threat um, and of course, what impact it has. Yeah, what what you need is a is a, a grant and a boat uh, to answer that question. <laughs> so it anyone would be nice. Would, uh, yeah, it would any, be nice. Anyone who'd like to, uh, <laughs> to 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 help Guillermo might <laughs> um, go ahead. But uh, yeah, uh, anyone else with any other um, comments or, or questions? Another really nice comment from Rodrigo. Um, very kind. Uh, Teresa challenge accepted. Um, Thanks for all yeah, the comments, if, if anyone, everyone. Yeah. yeah, it's really nice to see you guys uh, all engaging here. Um, this was a, a, a webinar that we were really looking forward to, actually, and so it's it's great to see you guys here uh, as well. Uh, if there's no other questions, I'll just give you an, another couple of moments to get any other questions in there. Um, I think that's. I think that's everything. We are also at our, at our time. So I know that some of you have taken time off work and things to, to follow this. So I don't want to go over time too much. Guillaume was very good at sticking to his uh, allotted time. Um, so yeah, well, let me, in that case, if there's no other questions, let me just say once again, uh, on behalf of uh, everyone here at AIM Portugal, but also on behalf of everyone uh, that participated today, uh, a huge thank you to Guillermo for taking uh, all this time to not only make the presentation, but to, to share all this knowledge uh, with us all. Uh, it was very, very informative and really enjoyable. So, so thanks again, Guillermo. Um, no, my I pleasure. If, uh, if we obviously, we have um, contact information at the bottom of the screen here for, for AIM. Uh, if anyone had any uh, direct questions that they wanted to uh, post to Guillermo, uh, feel free to, to get in touch with us uh, that way. But uh, Guillermo, do, can, can you also uh, mention the, the Facebook group yes. that you have there? Yes, yeah, so um, the first iteration uh, of trying to um, partner up with other companies was a um, very, um, how to say it, demoralizing Facebook group where uh, I was expecting people to share pictures of false killer whales but it didn't work out very well. Although the page still exi exists, it's called False Killer Whales Portugal. We are also looking into potential matches with Madeira Island, but we do not have anything yet. And also with the Canary Islands. But um, if you want to, you can stop by. There's not a lot in there. There's some information. And if there is a sighting, I will uh, post it there. Um, but uh, for any other type of, uh, of inquiry, or if you want to send data, I will actually ask you to send it to sodorcaportugal at gmail.com, which I just typed into chat, which is uh, uh, the official email for data submissions. Okay, <coughs> fantastic. Um, so yeah, uh, feel free to drop Guilherme a, a line if you, you have any uh, further questions. I know there's a lot to, to digest. So um, yeah, get in touch uh, if, if you want to. So thanks again, Guilherme. Um, Thank you very much. Just, just before we, we say goodbye, I also just want to 
uh, to mention, um, obviously here uh, on in continental Portugal, where we're uh, we're based, uh, our internship program has uh, has begun, despite the um, uh, the, the COVID nineteen pandemic this year. We we have uh, been able, fortunately been able to to initiate our uh, internship program a little bit late, but uh, but nonetheless it's up and running. So. Um, if, if you guys uh, are interested at all in uh, coming to see a little bit more of the work that we do here in continental Portugal, um, then do get in touch. Um, also, we, uh, if, if that's not possible, if you're uh, maybe not able to travel or other commitments, we're also running our uh, in, uh, online course where we'll take a more sort of general look at, at uh, uh, whale and dolphin species in the, the, the world of whales and dolphins. Um, this is a two-week course. Uh, it's about uh, 10 hours in, in total, running over two weeks. Um, and if that's something that's interesting for you as well, do let us know. The course has officially begun already, but uh, you can actually catch up. So as long as you um, subscribe before uh, the end of the course, uh, you'll be okay. Uh, so yeah, obviously drop us uh, an email. Uh, you, you have the contacts uh, below. Um, just before we go, I also want to just introduce, uh, we have uh, with us at the moment uh, an intern who, uh, who actually participated in the online course uh, previously in, in the previous month. So I'll just, I'll introduce Joanna here. Hi everyone. <laughs> um, ah, let's unplug this. Uh, so I just want to say that uh, the course was amazing. It's an introductory course and we get a general uh, view of everything, the behavior part, the, how they live, the interaction with humans and the general history of uh, dolphins and whales. It's, I totally recommend it. And uh, I'm now doing the internship and I'm loving it. <laughs> uh, it's really different to actually see and be in loco with the, the animals and learn uh, how to interact and to see the behaviors they they're doing. Uh, I'm really loving it. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Joanna. <laughs> so um, uh, apologies to Joanna. We kind of sprung that on her a little bit late, but um, uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, do get in touch. Uh, obviously uh, drop Guilherme an email as well if you have more uh, in, uh, questions uh, about his project uh, out there in the Azores. But uh, now all that remains to say is just to thank you all again for, uh, for, for participating, um, for your involvement and for all your comments and questions. Um, it was really a good one this week and uh, we hope to see you all again soon. Uh, so goodbye from here in, uh, in, in Portugal. And uh, if Guilherme is still there, uh, goodbye from Guilherme. Bye. Thanks, Henry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Bye for now, everyone. Take care. Bye. Cheers.